Hello, everybody. My name is David Andalfato. I'm uh, Vice President in the Research Division at the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. And with me here today is uh, distinguished economist Marty Eichenbaum from Northwestern University, who's going to be uh, talking to us a little bit about the paper he's presenting here at the conference. Marty, welcome to the 38th uh, annual St. Louis Fed Policy Conference. I see that you're presenting a, ver a, a paper with a very interesting title here, very pertinent to the policy situation today, Unemployment and Business Cycles. I was wondering if you wouldn't mind telling us a little bit about the question that you're addressing in this, in this paper and, and what sort of findings you have. Sure, that's great. Um, the, the, it's, the paper's part of a larger project trying to develop richer models of labor markets that can be uh, used to uh, understand events like the Great Recession and what kind of policies uh, might, might we use to deal with those events. So you know, why did the labor force participation rate drop so dramatically um, uh, during the Great Recession? Why did employment drop so dramatically uh, and unemployment rose so dramatically? So a central puzzle that goes back to the beginning of modern macro, which I date with a paper by Bob Lucas and Leonard Rapping, um, is the observation that employment is incredibly volatile uh, and uh, real wages aren't. And that's been this basic roadblock uh, for just lots of lots of theories, so whether you're a real business cycle person or you're a new you know, it's a very, very tough problem. Um, and what happens in a lot of um, those, those models is, is, is when there's an expansionary shock to the economy, real wages really rise very dramatically, and that chokes off the expansionary forces in the economy. And that's just counterfactual. It doesn't happen that way. The kind of models that uh, are very popular in policy circles that I and Larry Cristiano and co-authors worked on solve that problem very mechanically. We just say, look, wages are sticky. We don't know why. Uh, and now let's go to town. That's fine for some purposes, but it rules out lots of incredibly important policy questions. For example, uh, what happens if we raise unemployment benefits? If you go to the standard model that the board might use, uh, the answer is nothing, just nothing. The, the model's silent on that. Wages are sticky, workers work, and that's that. But of course, in reality, that's, that's not true. So then you might say, well, if you don't really believe that, uh, or you can't use the models for that question, why do you trust the models for other questions that you ask of it when it comes to policy, like the effects of um, increasing government spending, or the effects of um, uh, quantitative easing, uh, that depends so centrally on labor markets, we just really don't know until we develop such a model, and hopefully this is one step in that direction. Does your model uh, have anything, uh, any advice to offer to uh, central bankers in terms of the effects of programs like quantitative easing in times of a, a recession, deep recession, like what we've witnessed recently? Right now, we're not at the stage where we're focused on monetary policy so much, but more in fiscal policy. Mm -hmm. So, for example, one of the things that comes out of the analysis is extending unemployment, uh, the duration of unemployment benefits has some pluses for, for fairly standard reasons. But it has uh, another feature, which may not be so obvious, which is when you have high unemployment benefits, it actually increases the sensitivity of the economy to other types of shocks. So it's like you're, 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 you're driving faster, that's good, but if you get into an accident, it's going to be a lot bigger. So that's the kind of implications that we're really getting out right now. Does your model, um, what sort of mo uh, interpretation of the most recent recession and lackluster recovery does your model offer? Okay, so that's a, a great question. And we have our computers hard at work uh, <laughs> for a conference next week uh, in Boston. Um, what, the mark, what, what the model mechanically, one of the big puzzles, for example, facing new Keynesian models is why didn't inflation fall uh, the way simple new Keynesian models often predict? Well, it turns out that if you uh, look at reduced form type statistical evidence, two really interesting things are true. When you have big uh, increases in total factor productivity, that tends to really cause inflation to go down. So that's just a statistical regularity. Put that together with some observations that we have right now, which is that total factor productivity is incredibly, the growth rate has slowed down dramatically. When you put that in this kind of a model, what, we're say, what we get is that the reason, we, the reason inflation hasn't fallen the way these models would tell you generally is people have ignored the fact that TFP has, has fallen so slowly. And so you have these competing effects. The net is that inflation hasn't moved very much. 
And then we can use those two forces to talk about what the net effect is on labor market dynamics. And the net is that we're in a very slow, lousy recovery. You mentioned something about labor force participation. Does your model make a distinction? Uh, does it model all three labor market states, employment, unemployment, and participation? The paper I'll give today doesn't, but the mm -hmm. paper that I'm giving next week, which is an extension of this paper, okay. explicitly makes that distinction. Um, Many commentators have pointed to uh, external forces as uh, either causing or exacerbating the, uh, the, the recession or the, the slowdown in the recovery. Um, Marty, uh, does your model have anything to say about that? Open economy variants of the model will certainly have sort of the standard prediction about how a decline in export you know, has very dire consequences, especially when the zero lower bound is binding. But the model also has a lot to say about the U.S. economy's exposure, in particular labor market exposure, uh, to countries like China, South Korea, places like that. Standard models that we use in macro, really certainly sticky wage models, have nothing to say about American workers' wages mm -hmm. and how they respond to the potential to offshore, uh, the potential to uh, substitute for American labor. These models, because they are bargaining models in the end, workers are in a much weaker position uh, when they go into uh, negotiations. And even if they don't have an explicit union, there's going to be a real impact on wages. So let's say uh, this weaker bargaining position owing to the competition offered by China might manifest itself how exactly? Lower wages Lower and higher wages. unemployment in the short run. Lower wages and higher unemployment. Exactly. Interesting. So, Marty, what would you say is the key takeaway to your research here today that you're presenting? In this paper today, the key takeaway is why wages are sticky really matters. It's not innocuous to just assume it. Very good. Very interesting.